going for a door prize. So hang on until the end. Um, again, go ahead and settle in, grab your lunch or refreshments, um, and we will get going here with our speaker and heard. Um, so today's session is asking powerful coaching questions. Uh, it's a, been a pretty hot topic and a popular one, so we hope you glean some good little tidbits from today. Um, so our speaker today is Dr. Ann Hurd. She is a faculty member. Uh, she teaches both with the Organizational Leadership and Learning Program, as well as the Master's in Human Resources and Organization Development. So she is a great resource that we have here at UofL. Um, Dr. Hurd is a board certified executive and leadership coach. She has served as an executive and leadership coach for many years for leaders in all types of organizations. She's published work on using assessments in coaching and most recently on the use of motivational interviewing. And she's taught advanced coaching workshops for board certified executive coaches. So we are thrilled to have her here to share her experience and expertise with us. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Hurd. Thank you, and it's great to see everyone. Uh, everyone here has a lot of experience and wisdom about asking powerful questions. So, uh, and, and and in coaching, right? Um, we all do coaching somehow, some way, uh, in our various roles, our work and our non-work roles require coaching skills. So I am uh, passionate about this topic because we can never be too good at asking questions a certain way that will help the other person move forward in a positive way. Um, it, it's something that we can practice moment to moment, uh, day by day, and um, you can never be perfect at this and so it's it's really really worth it um as far as one skill that we can all use uh to be more influential to make the world a better place really um to make the world a more positive place so um Today, uh, I'd like us to talk about what we say and think about asking questions. And um, at, at Susan's um, prompt, which I really appreciate, Susan Hildebrand here, um, we will be looking at three powerful steps in asking powerful questions. Activate the vision, seek smart goals, and kindle resolve. It was hard for me to come up with the K. Um, and then we will um, do some self-assessment and some action plans and some practice with this. Uh, so quick survey, what have been some powerful questions that you have been asked? If you could um, write in the chat and also speak up. So think throughout your life, think about yesterday even. Um, a question that someone asked you that actually somehow spurred you in some way, um, preferably in a positive way, a a powerful, positive question um, that, you know, a powerful question can be defined as transformational, but it doesn't always have to be, wow, you know, changing your life transformational. It can just be an aha moment. It can be a little bit of feedback that you hadn't thought about before. So um, put in the chat and um, please speak up about some powerful questions that you've been asked and what made these questions powerful for you. Um, let's see, I'm looking at the chat. I see Deb saying resistance is futile. <laughs> But that wasn't the question, I'm sure. <laughs> that could have been your, uh, that's what you question your spouse, right? <laughs> Do not resist. Uh, yeah, Ron? Actually, actually, there's a, yeah, a uh, reference to Star Trek uh, about resistance being futile, about joining the, you know, the collective in response to the, uh, you know, get, not getting onto social media. Uh, awesome. Ron? And one of the best questions I ever had, someone asked me um, was, who are you? And I, that was always a great question. That one stumped. I remember getting that question and it, it, it to this day, 
you know, when I get confused about things, I'll ask myself internally, who am I? And that, that's that was a great question. I, I just trying to respond to your questions. I, I always really appreciated that one. So what made it powerful for you? I think it was a because it's such a self-reflective thing. It immediately for me and turned into a, OK, if I can answer the question who I am, then the next question becomes how am I to other people, right? So I start with me and then figure out my interactions with others. Um, and then the whole dynamic of how is that interaction is a totally different conversation for me, but it was, you know, who are you was the greatest question. And I got that question from a counselor, by the way. It was, I was 32 years old and I had just found out, you know, dramatic information about my father and uh, who had passed long ago. And that was, he just asked the question, who are you? And I just remember, just I, I couldn't even talk. I couldn't even respond. And I thought, what a fantastic, um, what a fantastic reflective question to have. And since that time, uh, well, I'm 29 now, so I don't know how that could have been 32. But either way, as I've gotten older, that question always just kind of is one that um, when I've talked and engaged with people, uh, that's one that comes up that I think sometimes fits perfectly. Wow, thank you. You were sharing about your father. Um, if I think about who am I in relation to my father, it is an awesome question. <laughs> so thank you. Um, who else has an example? I see. I think I see a hand, but I'm not sure. Oh, um, oh Samantha Jones. Good morning. Thank you for having me here with you guys. So it's a question that someone asked me about four years ago in my first um, kind of leadership role. And it was, you know, not only what goals do you want to achieve, but what are you willing to give up for that goal? Because we all have intention to get somewhere or to accomplish something. But most times, especially as Mothers, you know, we juggle so many things. If it's that important to you, what are you willing to give up to accomplish this? And what must you give up? So it kind of takes intention to action. And it's really a tangible thing. Like, what do you need to cut out to help you focus on where you need to go? And it was one of the most powerful things um, that someone did to me. And so I use it now. Um, I train new hires um, on systems in our company and policies and um, also do a lot of um, diversity training. And um, it's just something that I can use in so many things. I mean, I even use it as a mother with my middle school daughter. You know, if this is who you want to be or where do you want to be, then what do you have to do to accomplish that? And then if there's things we need to get rid of, that's the first step. And it's just really powerful. Oh, that is awesome. You know, it, it reminds me, uh, if you don't mind, my, I'll share very quickly is uh, my daughter coached me on this herself. Uh, so um, the culture in my family and just in, you know, with me is just add more to the plate, do more, 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 more is better. And um, at one point, my uh, high school daughter said, uh, Mom, I'm not going to do this um, Girl Scout Gold Award unless I give up something else. <laughs> So, and I was her truth leader, and I'm like, what? <laughs> no, you can add this to your plate. So that is very powerful. Thank you. And that's probably one of the most important questions to ask. Uh, that's very helpful in today's world with just expanding workloads, expanding roles. Um, that's awesome. So was it powerful to you, uh, Samantha, because um, what, how was it powerful when you were asked that question? Um, it was kind of that as well. You know, um, at that time in my life, I had just become a single mom and I had young children, which require much more attention than where we are today. And I was also kind of 
striving to get ahead in my career. So the thing is, is that, you know, I'm like you. Um, I was also that was kind of ingrained in me, uh, you know, as a personality trait and in the family setting I was raised in. You know, you just do and do and do and add to your play and um, it, and it really just struck me because it gave me a perspective that I had never looked at. When she asked me that question, you know, well, what are you willing to give up? And sometimes it doesn't mean that you just have to necessarily give something up. But like I said, it really takes intention to action and it helps you be honest within yourself. What can I handle? Because, you know, we all make commitments to things and then we don't give our best effort or we try to give our best effort, but are we really giving 100%? And if you wanna be the employee or the human being that gives 100%, you have to be very intentional about what you give your energy to. So awesome. Uh, and, and I'm seeing in the chat, um, I think the, you know, where do you see yourself and what do you want your position to look like? Um, what is your why? Uh, so powerful. Um, you know, just the, where do you want to be? Where do you see yourself in a few years? Uh, some of us never even think about a few years. <laughs> we think about 10 minutes from now. <laughs> and so it's an eye opener. <laughs> and what's the difference between a leader and a supervisor? And I think that might be powerful in thinking about, um, you know, what, which, which one do you want to be to go back to Ron's question? Um, Oh, and Meg, what would life look like if X problem was magically solved? Yes, there you go. So see the end, have the end in mind. And um, we have lots of other good ones. So let's talk about, um, you know, on the flip side, less powerful questions tend to be the ones that make you look back and um, elicit fear or blame or shame. Um, not that there isn't always a place for those somewhere along the line. Uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Mike Rush, began our motivational seminar. The very first thing out of his mouth was fear is the greatest motivator. And it really got it definitely got our attention um, <laughs> as far as the motivation part. But luckily, um, the rest of the seminar did not keep going along those same lines. Less powerful questions often seem kind of redundant, out of touch, like the other person isn't really hearing you. Um, definitely the very much less powerful questions are those that are focused on what the questioner wants as opposed to really focusing on the other person. So, um, and then that can feel like pushing a rock up a hill. Um, and the less powerful questions tend to take an expert telling approach as opposed to having the, um, the coachy, I'll call them, um, take ownership for the answers. More powerful questions, on the other hand, elicit curiosity. They're, they really are curious, they're open. Um, they avoid the critical why. Why is why a critical question? <laughs> why is that something to avoid in general? Any thoughts on that? What happens when someone asks you the why question? Or they phrase it with a why? Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it sounds like, it can sound like judgment, right? So if the person is already in kind of a self-critical mode, especially, or if the why is clearly a critical question, <laughs> like why did you lie about getting this paper done on time or something like that, um, that can definitely elicit, um, you know, not, not necessarily a great way forward. 
Um, there are other ways to phrase it. So it's it is worthwhile to actually plan and think ahead of time. I'm a huge advocate of scripting out at least the beginning of a conversation, especially that is um, around some kind of negative feedback or trying to find out what happened in a um, work setting for a performance issue or um, you know, some kind of troubling issue that you're not sure is to actually script out and think of a way to phrase the question. Even if you say, um, what are some of the factors that are going on or, you know, turn it into a what question um, can be very helpful. More powerful questions provide self insight. They help the other person have clarity. So, um, you know, the, the powerful questions that we have as examples, you know, who am I? Who are you? Um, it helps really bring into focus and some clarity what is important to you. Um, they help the coachee feel heard and understood. They focus on the future. So uh, Jerry's, you know, powerful question and several, several that I saw, um, you know, what does the future look like? What's the ideal future look like? They help the coachee take ownership, and instead of being a telling expert approach, they take a partner facilitator approach. Um, a great way to kind of think about questions is to consider that in general, thinking questions tend to elicit more of the aha moments and they tend to be more powerful. Non-thinking questions certainly have their place. They tend to be about details, um, facts, and it is very helpful, of course, for non thinking questions. They, you know, to find out the context of what the coachee is working on or thinking about. Um, so, some examples of non thinking questions What are the details? What time did this happen? Um, what did the other person say next in the conversation? Again, they can be very helpful to provide context. Thinking questions. On the other hand, tend to be um, more motivational, more powerful. What do you see as some possible outcomes? What is the what outcome would you like to have in this particular scenario? Um, what positive intention do you have in taking this action? Um, what is your goal here? What does it look like when this is successfully resolved? Um, a motivational interviewing question is on a scale of one to 10, how clear is your thinking about this issue? What will it take to make it a 10? So those types of questions uh, tend to be more powerful questions. And again, thinking ahead, there's nothing wrong with um, with actually practicing and um, considering ahead of time, you know, when you can, um, how to practice, uh, you know, some non thinking question, oh, excuse me, some thinking questions definitely makes a difference as a parent, right? You know, you could ask your child, um, how was your day? And, you know, your child might just say, fine, you know, and so thinking of other ways to uh, elicit actual connection and I'm, I'm thinking about teenagers, but you know, even even a young child, you know, if lunch is the most important part of their day, then you could say, tell me about your lunch. What did you have? <laughs> you know, they're really into food or what was the best part of your day or some other way to rephrase it so that you can actually get the connection going that you desire. Another major focus for powerful questions is to increase self-awareness. So what percentage of the population would would say that they are self-aware? Um, you know, I put on the slide here a great article, Harvard Business Review um, article that um, found that most people actually consider themselves to be self-aware. I have no idea, like, how would you it's one. It's the Yohari window. How do you know if you're not self-aware? Um, 
I had a very, very close, close friend um, tell me this week, and this person is extremely confident, um, tell me I'm very humble. And I was like, ah, uh, there's some kind of disconnect I'm feeling about the statement that I'm very humble, <laughs> especially knowing how confident you are. Um, so, you know, a quote from this article is that even though most people think they are self-aware, only 10 to 15 percent of the people studied actually are when compared with um, their you know, 360 degree ratings and other ways to see, as Ron said, um, you know, how other people see you, who are you, and then what do other people think when, you know, when they're thinking about you? Is there is there a disconnect between that? Um, and this study suggests that there is a disconnect and it's, it's a constant process. So you're actually giving a gift when you can ask a question that helps a person be more self-aware. It'll help them move forward in their life and with their goals. So three actions for asking powerful questions. Activate the vision, seek smart goals, and kindle resolve. Activate the vision is really the first one because this opens up the possibilities, right? It helps get at, as you all said, the why. Um, it, it helps with the energy. It, 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 um, when we think about motivation, it's classically defined as energizing, directing, and sustaining our behavior. And activating the vision helps tremendously with the energizing component of motivation. So I just listed some of the um, you know, some of the most common ways, especially as a coach, of activating the vision. Um, and please, I would love to hear other ideas. Um, imagine your ideal life. Uh, I remember uh, here at University of Louisville, uh, Paula Comer, who's an excellent, awesome coach and um, a a teacher and facilitator of coaches and coaching skills. She taught classes for our wellness coaching minor here at the University of Louisville. And um, she led faculty and staff through an ideal life scenario. And it was eye opening for me as a coach because I had never participated in this type of visioning activity. So um, there are lots of different ways to do a visioning activity, uh, but imagine your ideal life is one. It's a great one to close your eyes and, um, you know, relax. Possibly music can be helpful for this. Deep breaths, get centered and focused and just let yourself uh, imagine your ideal life. Um, close your eyes and imagine what you see, what you hear, what you're doing, who you're with. Notice these things as far as what pops into your head when you ask yourself, what is my ideal life? Um, who's around me? And perhaps most importantly, what do you feel? Um, we tend to forget about the importance of uh, feelings as a valid part of our whole selves and our whole experiences. Um, and then just think about whatever did pop into your head for your ideal life and what are the underlying components of this vision? What do you think when, when you have participated in a visioning exercise or when other people do this, what do you think are some of the underlying components that emerge when they're imagining their ideal life? Values or components? <laughs> I'm looking at the chat. I rock really. So what would you think if you were imagining your own ideal life? And, you know, sometimes the ideal life 
technical um, details of what comes to mind, like you're on the beach and you have no work to do whatsoever <laughs> and you don't even have a to-do list or, um, you know, some of, sometimes the ideal life isn't necessarily something that's feasible financially or given your um, where you are in life. But what are what's the underlying feeling that you have? And this is Jerry. Um, I think that when certainly when I've had to try to think through this uh, for myself, I had to get out of my head and more into my heart. And and what uh, I, I appreciate your comments about what it felt like or what it might feel like in this ideal life. And um, so I, I think it's a matter of uh, unhooking your head for a little while and just letting your heart sing out and figure out what would really make you joyful each and every day. Um, have you done this, Jerry, as far as would you have a, a picture that you could share with us that pops into your mind? Or if you haven't done it recently or don't care to share, that's fine. <laughs> Well, it's not a beach because it's too hot. Um, <laughs> so that's not it for me. No palm trees. Um, I just spent a week in Colorado last week in Vail. And boy, it'd be pretty ideal if I could stay there all the time uh, in the summer. I'm not a big winter guy either. So um, that was fabulous. I, I th you know, I honestly think I found my ideal life now. Um, I, I've been at the university for 35 years now. And this past four years for me have been the most joyful and satisfying for me because of what I get to do. That's awesome. So the components that make this an ideal life, the word joy, I think you said it at least two times. <laughs> uh, you know, so joy, I think, is an underlying component. And I don't want to put words in your mouth because a coach is never supposed to do that. So <laughs> are there any other... Uh, components that come to mind? Well, I, I think a feeling for me of contribution that uh, what I do makes a difference to for others. Uh, the work that I get to do with faculty development now at the Health Sciences Center means a great deal to me. And I sort of fell into it. I conceived of it, but I didn't realize how important it would be. Uh, but I followed that. And then now that we're in it for four years, I just can't imagine doing anything else now and getting as much satisfaction and encouragement and just feelings that I'm I'm contributing in a meaningful way. That yes. that's what's been so important for me. Oh, that is very inspiring. How many else find that inspiring? <laughs> the impact, the meaning. You use the word contribution several times. Um, ideal, ideal life. I'm looking at the chat. Iris, can you expand on the power of now? That's that even just the phrase is powerful. If you're available. Hi. Hi, hi I didn't expect to speak, but hi. Um, the power of now is being present um, because I think if you constantly search for other things and you're not present in the moment and appreciate what you have, it gives you an unstable foundation and sometimes unrealistic goals. Um, and the power of now is from Eckhart Tolle. Yes, He's a philosopher. I, yeah. So yeah, I've watched YouTube uh, yeah. over and over. <laughs> How many does he have out there? It's just like almost just brings you in. So E K H A R T T O L L E, I think is correct. If, okay. if anyone yeah. wants to I, get a um, energizer. Yeah. And I use meditation, daily meditation to to accomplish or try to accomplish that. That's that's it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing. And um, presence, being present in the moment, um, not being pulled in so many different directions. Uh, the you know the times that I have done this with executives, you never know what what it, the actual vision will pop up. I know that the first time I did it, I was um, preparing a meal for my family, lots of sunshine, bright lights, through, bright sunshine through the window with my daughters, and we were joking around and looking forward to 
people coming over and that wasn't really realistic as far as a dream you know a vision just because i'm uh, uh, um I tend to get stressed when I'm, uh, you know, we entertain a lot and I, you know, trying to get everything to come out on time. So I don't remember a lot of times where I was, you know, joking around as I did this. But when I reflected on it, the underlying components were time with my daughters and the joy with my daughters, you know, like you said, joy, connection, Um and it led me to think about how can I have more of that in my life? And, um, you know, as a coach, coaching myself, um, you know, I was able to think of some smart goals and some ways to make sure that that I actually had that, even if it wasn't that particular scenario. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at, you know, focus on mindful fulfillment and peaceful, time to reflect, fulfilling, calling of my heart, time with family, your, your values. So these are great examples that actually help open up and activate and energize and bring about that hope that is kind of the precursor to actually achieving and um, helping the other person to achieve uh, facilitating their, their vision, their goals. Um, imagine your best self. There are some awesome activities that you, you know, that are helpful in leading a person through this imagining um, what is your mission? What is your brand? What do you want to do? That question in and of itself can be quite powerful, even depending on as a coach, how you emphasize it. What do you want to do, right? in response to um, something they're telling you. What do you want to do in response to possibly, um, you know, someone who's being, who feels a lot of expectations from other people that might not align um, with their own vision? What do you want to do? What do you want to do <laughs> to, to help someone focus on action if they haven't really been focusing on action? Like just that one sentence can be quite powerful. Um, one that I really like right now, and I think we hear a lot, is this idea of intention. It can be quite powerful to ask yourself before you're about to engage in an activity or, you know, even even do something that you might consider tedious or it's a it's a to do list item. What is your intention right now? What is my intention right now? How do I want to show up? How can I be mindful? Who am I in this particular situation? What is my intention? Um, so, you know, this slide uh, kind of goes through the ideal life vision using the GROW model, which is the most common model in coaching. It's kind of the underlying framework for all of coaching, really. Um, you know, what are the underlying dimensions of this vision? How much of these dimensions are currently showing up in your life? Um, are you mindful? Are you present right now? Um, what are some options? What ideas do you have about getting more of these dimensions? Um, and what would you like to be doing differently to get um, more meaning, more contribution, more of this heart, heart feeling um, three months from now? And what, what steps can you commit to doing this week? Um, to move you forward even slightly in getting more of that dimension in your life. Um, a values activity is, is extremely helpful for activating um, your vision. So, you know, asking what guiding principles do you live by? This goes back to thank you, Ron. Who are you? Who am I? Um, how is each of these values showing up? You know, a lot of people say family is their number one value. Um, and and when they think about where they spend their time, um, it isn't showing up as much as they would like in terms of having alignment between their values and where they spend their time. So what is one small step that you can take to see more of a particular value? 
So once we activate the vision, the second step is to move forward, as I've kind of outlined here, into seeking SMART goals. So goals that are specific, um, they are somehow measurable. Um, I like to push back on this idea of measurable. Um, the qualitative types of goals, feeling goals, are measurable also. So you can be, the other person, your coachee, can certainly determine, you know, that um, I, I feel that what I'm doing is meaningful. You know, it's a six right now. And, um, and they can monitor, you know, this, this, uh, this goal that they have, this underlying dimension. So there are ways to make goals measurable. Um, they don't necessarily have to be counting widgets or uh, what we typically think of as objective measures. Um, achievable, you know, something that is realistic. It's it's more motivating to achieve even a tiny bit of goal. So that's why I think the atomic habits movement has taken off, you know, that you can call it a success if you actually put your running shoes by the front door for three days in a row. You don't have to go running. You don't have to even put the shoes on. You just take one small step. It's achievable. You can do it toward building a new habit that will help you move forward with your fitness goals, as an example. Um, the relevant, the R, is extremely important because this ties back to what activates your vision. So it's relevant to you personally, to who you are, to your values, to your vision. And then perhaps most, most frequently overlooked is the timely part. It needs to actually get on your calendar and it needs a time, a date, a place. It needs intention, very specific intention around it for it to work um, as well as it can in terms of setting goals. So some examples of questions around SMART goals. Um, like I said, your goal and how does this goal relate to your mission, vision and values, your purpose, your why, as we said earlier. What does success look, look like? How will you know that you're achieving it? It doesn't even have to say, I, I could have rephrased this to how will you know you are achieving it, right? Because a lot of times these things are ongoing journeys. Um, what will it take to achieve this goal? What are some of the steps? Um, what do you want to commit to taking, you know, to doing now? this week? What, what's one small step that you would like to take to move forward? When will you do this? The time and the days. One of my very favorite books is The Power of Full Engagement, and there are a couple of classic Harvard Business Review articles that summarize this. But in the book, this is taken straight out of the Lauren and Schwartz book, an example of some smart goals of uh, leaders um, you might have the same goal, for example, I mean, the same behavior, but the reason for that behavior, the why, is different for each person, right? So this particular person, an example, their target was they wanted more positivity, more passion in their life. Um, their underlying values that they saw as driving this were integrity, family, um, and what they wanted to see was greater persistence, greater resilience. Um, and so the action steps, the SMART goals they set were um, every morning, read their vision statement at 6.30, um, review, you know, on the way to work, review their activities, rehearse some positive framing, um, have something visual on their screensaver that's inspiring to them. So having the vision statement on the screensaver was what they came up with. And then having some kind of emergency ritual, like giving themselves a timeout or a mindfulness break, or there are all kinds of ideas for emerg emergency rituals when they're feeling negative and you know they're they're not able to achieve this goal so this is just one example of a smart goal 
um, the final step is to kindle that resolve that helps you keep going, right? So the energizing, directing, and sustaining. That sustaining behavior is the K here. It's the resolve, kindling resolve. Um, how will you celebrate your success in even a small step, in achieving a small step to the goal? A lot of us, um, you know, our general United States culture, I'm just, I'm speaking very much in general terms, um, is all about that more, 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 more. And, you know, not... It's it's extremely helpful to stop and acknowledge and celebrate your success and uh, and your movement and your forward movement and acknowledge this. Um, so asking someone, how would you celebrate your success when you leave those shoes by the front door for a couple of days in a row? What will it feel like when you achieve this goal? How are you going to handle some of the rough spots? So one of my favorite uh, ways to do this K component, the Kindle Resolve, is motivational interviewing. And um, just had an article um, accepted for publication like last week on this particular technique. So um, the basic components are to ask your coachee, um, how confident are you on a scale, on some kind of scale, using a, um, you know, one to 10 is easy. Um, and if their answer is a seven or, um, excuse me, I should have said seven or below, then you want, you might want to ask what could get in the way, what can be done to, what can you do to address this potential barrier? What kinds of supports can you have to help them work through whether their goal is, you know, is achievable um, and realistic and, um, you know, help them come up with ways that they can, can do it. So I'd like for all of us here to do this five box exercise. So if you could jot down in front of you the answers to each of these five questions in the box, um, just jot down very, very quickly as I go through them. So the very first goal is, I mean, the first question here is, what is a goal that you've had for a while but not achieved? It can be big or small, however you perceive it, but um, jot down what is a goal that you have had for a while but not achieved. Second question here is how long have you had this goal? Third question is what has gotten in the way? So what has gotten in the way? Fourth question is, what is one small step you can take to move forward with this goal? What is one small step you can take to move forward with this goal? And the final question is, how will you feel when you have achieved this goal? How would you feel, how will you feel when you have achieved this goal? So I would love it if you all could share. Um, and I'm trying to look at the... the chat here. Um, is anyone able to share the goal that came up when you were thinking about a goal you have not achieved, but you've had for a while? Big or small? Dang, do I have to say it out loud? <laughs> No blame, no shame, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's rule number one. Um, you don't have to, Deb. <laughs> um, let's see. I think the sad thing is, is 
for me, it was trying to figure out what my goals were with everything going on in the past couple of years. I think they've taken such a, a back seat that I think it's time that we need to reassess and I need to figure out what those goals are again. Oh my goodness. So what comes to mind? I think I think as far as goals for me, it's more because I've had so many changes that it's littler goals. It's it's goals to make time for family again and take time to heck, take time to read a book. Um, you know, it, it's been so busy that that there's just no time. I mean, it's it's reassessing, I think, is is what my goals would be. I love it. So um, are you willing? I'm trying to see who is speaking. Amy. Amy, awesome. Um, are you I'm wondering if you're willing for uh, the rest of us to ask you some ASK goal, uh, questions, powerful <laughs> questions about um, getting more uh, uh, about reading a book. How about that? So um, <laughs> uh, I can ask, let's let's assume that I start started with what would you like to be coached on today and um you know i'm hearing you say that you long to have time to read a book um i am also hearing that you long to have more time with your family um so let's say that we focused on the reading a book what are some questions that the rest of us can ask amy that might help her move forward with this goal any kinds of questions, thinking or non-thinking? If you could put them in the chat and also speak up. Awesome, Samantha. So um, I was gonna say, I think, you know, making a list so it becomes piece by piece what you need to do, whether it's something you need to accomplish or something you wanna do. And I think the first question or somewhere like, well, what kind of book do you want to read? Because you're not going to do it if you don't enjoy what you're reading. So like, what do you, what do you want to read? Do you want to learn something or do you want to escape through the book and read something fictional? So what is exactly the genre of book you want to read? And then, you know, pick something out and then decide how you're going to make time to do it. Awesome. Uh, Wonderful. So, Amy, what if we even condense, you know, kind of shorten that uh, for the activating the vision part, which is um, tell us more about your desire to read a book? <laughs> well, I think I think it's the little things. I mean, you know, we get so over we get so bogged down with work and and just life in general that um it, it like you were saying at the beginning it's all about the little decisions you know we make decisions to do what we do throughout the day and you know i can make a decision to read the stack of books that i've got on my on my nightstand um but then there are decisions that we make that lead up to where you just don't have time um uh, and it's all about you know, perspective. It's about, you know, making time to do it. And, and uh, you know, like, like she was saying, as far as the lists, I, I've got lists. Um, my, my focus, you know, I changed jobs. So my focus lately has been work. Um, I, as far as the books I do, I, I like to learn. So I'm always trying to learn. Um, that whole segment on, on finding your why and why in general, um, those are always intrigued me and and uh, you know I help to uh, train our people so that they can find theirs as well. Um, so you know i'm I'm always with with our people, and so I just want to make sure that I think it's time that I need to take a take a step back and 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 find my why again as well. So perhaps um, we might be hearing that you long for the time 
um, yeah. that uh -huh. is and it, it might not even necessarily be the reading the book per se is as more as longing for some free freed up time from yeah i've just got work on my schedules what i've got to do so the the rest of us here which of these five questions did you find to be most motivating so um what which ones did you find to be most powerful i guess i would say melissa power woman power leader sorry i'm gonna have to get off i have a um meeting with my supervisor so say that again, oh, I can answer this question no, no, before no, I leave. No, no, that's okay. That, that is okay, Melissa, because that speaks directly to what Amy was just talking about. Um, so anyone in the chat, if you could put which question, one, two, three, four, or five, did you find to be most powerful? Um, the first one is what's a goal you've had? The second one is how long have you had it? Third one is what's gotten in the way? Fourth one is what's a small step you can take to move forward? Last one is how will you feel when you've achieved it? So let's just take a, a quick poll in the chat to see what are, which of these did you find to be? Three, I feel number three is the most important to me. And number three is the what has gotten in the way. So, um, and I don't want to, uh, Melissa, that's fine. I'm just wondering, Jennifer or Linda or, um, you know, Jessica, what was powerful about this particular question for you? <clears throat> Dr. Hurd, um, I said number three, this is Linda, um, because, I felt like I needed to understand what was stopping me. And for me, my goal has been to really set aside some devotional time specifically to hear and focus and to think about, you know, what I need to do in life. And if I know what's stopping me, <clears throat> then right now I feel like legalism and um, ritualism is that's what's getting in the way. And so for me, if I can think myself around that or or find out how to um, navigate around that, then I think I could at least start. If I'm not trying to please other people or do it the way that the books say I should or anybody else, if I could just find a way to do it for me, then then I would get unstuck. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So it helps kind of focus, uh, move toward a problem solving future, uh, you know, acknowledging what has gotten in the way so you can move forward. Um, I think I saw Trisha or Tara, I forget, uh, saying number five. What was powerful about that last question? Anyone? How will you feel when you've achieved it? And it's Ron, I, I agree with that. Num for me, number five is is the one that, you know, hit me the most. And that's the result at the end of the hard work. You know, where will I where will I like to land? And that's typically how I tend to operate internally is regardless of how hard it is. Where will I be when I get there? Right. So that's that's that was the one that was most impactful to me. Yes, it's the it, it activates the vi vision for sure. <laughs> Um, so I want us to think about which of these steps we would like to uh, intentionally practice today, tomorrow, this week um, in terms of activating the vision, seeking smart goals um, when we are asking questions to help influence others and kindling that resolve. Um, each of these is a different type of powerful question. Which one of these would you like to actively practice? Um, oh, and would you sorry. like to, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, good question. Um, so let's put that in the chat also about, um, you know, some intentional plans for asking powerful questions. And um, I would like to thank you all for your participation and uh, welcome feedback and follow up. Um, I do 
believe and know that asking is the most powerful way to bring about change. And so asking the question that unlocks uh, the vision, that unlocks the intention, uh, can help another person move forward in a positive way with their goals. Great. Thank you, Anne. Um, those were definitely such useful, practical tips going forward. So definitely thank you for that. Um, I know we are close to the end of the session, so we're not going to have time um, to do a Q&A at this point. Um, however, you are absolutely welcome again to follow up with any of us and Dr. Hurd has provided her contact information here. Um, I am going to turn it over to Susan Hildebrand to do a drawing for a swag uh, collection of swag as a thank you for taking time to join us here. So Susan, they're all yours. Hey, thanks everybody. I'll do it really quickly. You can't see my phone, but I use a wheel. Uh, it's it's one of those wheel of names. You might be able to hear it spinning, I hope. And our, our winner today is Aaron S. So Aaron, I'll be shooting you an email and we'll be getting you a swag bag here soon. Congratulations. Thank Again, Thanks. thank you everybody um, for taking the time to join our session today. Um, just a reminder, today's session was sponsored by the Organizational Leadership and Learning Program at UofL. Um, if you would like more information about that, um, I have put the link in the chat. So uh, click over to our program page. Um, otherwise, thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of your day. And Jose, yay. Man, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I'm going to stop the recording.